Good morning. Welcome. Glad that you're with us. It's great to be together to lift up the Lord in praise this morning. It's great to be together to worship the Lord. And, um, you know, I'm reminded this morning, we, we can't be everywhere at once. We have to choose where we're going to be. And I'm thankful that you've chosen to be here. It says something about our priorities when we choose to use our time to lift up the Lord. And whether you're uh, catching us uh, live on Sunday morning, catching us later Sunday or later in the week even, thank you for making a priority to use some time to, uh, to worship the Lord and to be in His Word and to spend time in communion with Him. I'm glad that you're here, glad that you're a part of this service. We welcome you anytime and uh, invite you to join in now as we lift up our voices and our hearts to the Lord in praise. Soldiers of Christ arise. Who? 
Reading from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 7. Isaiah 43, 1 through 7. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. And when you pass through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your stead. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give them up, and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. I believe in the sun. We can't be everywhere at once. We have to choose. We have to make priorities uh, out of work or out of family. We have to choose to be with one person we care for and away from other people we care for. We have to choose what's important to us at any given moment of the day. One of the things about God, though, is that He doesn't have to make that decision. The classical way to say it is that God is omnipresent. We're going to talk this morning about God's presence, God being with us. Let's pray together. 
God, we thank you that you are present, that you are with us. We thank you that wherever we go, you're there. We pray, Father, that we'll live our lives as though we're always in your presence, unafraid, courageous, confident. And, Father, that we'll live our lives to please you, to honor you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. God's omnipresence. It's one of those big words. We've talked about God's omnipotence and God's omniscience. You hear it in the word, don't you? Omnipresent. God is always fully present, everywhere, at the same time. Omnipresence doesn't mean that every being is divine. It doesn't mean that the universe is God, though sometimes in our world people speak of the universe in that way. It doesn't mean that God is spread out like a a gas throughout all of the universe, a little bit of God everywhere. God is always fully present everywhere. Wherever you're talking about, God is there. When Josh was little, he had an ant farm. I used to like to watch the ants in his ant farm. They all had their place. They all had their job. They all had something to do. And and thinking about that now and and looking back on it now, I'm thinking in terms of, of presence relative to the borders of those ants' world. I was omnipresent. I could see everything, affect anything. I could get to every ant. I could influence every event. Nothing in their world was off limits to me. And maybe that's the best illustration of omnipresence that I can think of. Because I'm not. I'm limited. I have to make a choice. I have to make a decision each minute of the day where I should be, where I should be spending my time. You do too. We're not omnipresent. But God is. God is present in every place. We've looked before in this series of lessons on what God is at Psalm 139. And beginning in verse 7, the psalmist writes, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. You hear it, don't you? Wherever the psalmist goes, he knows God is present. He knows that he can't run away, he can't escape, he can't flee. Not in the heavens, not in the depths, not far to the east, not far to the west. Wherever he is, God's hand will be on him. God will be with him. The way we understand God is that He is present in every part of our natural order, in every part of our world, in every moment, whether they're fleeting or momentous of history, God is there. He's as present now with us as He was during the Holocaust, during the signing of the Declaration of Independence. God is present everywhere, always. He's physically present in Jesus. That's what John was saying in the first chapter of his gospel as he tried to lay out this this amazing thing that had happened, this amazing thing that God had done. He came up with these words. The Word became flesh. The Word of God became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John echoes words and phrases from Exodus 33 where Moses sees God, sees sort of the 
the faint glow of his passing because that's all he can handle. And John says, we have seen him too, but we've seen him not like Moses from a distance with a, with a, a hand covering us, hidden safely away from, from seeing him fully. We have seen his glory, the glory of the Father, the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Paul puts it like this in Colossians 2, verse 9, for in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. God is present everywhere, but He's physically present in Jesus. And then sometimes in the Bible, God becomes known in these special places where God chooses to meet people and interact with people. You get one at Bethel with Jacob as he wakes up from his dream and says, surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. Those places where people meet with God sometimes are are set apart by faithful people who want to remember those moments and perhaps experience them again. But those those times when, when people say, surely the Lord was present, it doesn't mean He wasn't present everywhere else. Because Jacob experienced the Lord especially closely at Bethel doesn't mean that the Lord wasn't with Jacob all his life. God is present. And wherever there is, God is there. The universe for God is an open floor plan. You've seen that right on the, the, the home makeover shows, the renovation shows. When, when somebody buys a house, wants to flip a house, what do they do? Well, they want an open floor plan because everybody, every buyer wants an open floor plan today. No walls. They want to be able to see across the house. They want to be able to see the view out the back window from the front door. They want to be able to interact from the kitchen into the living space. The universe for God is an open floor plan. There are no walls to keep Him out. Nothing to obstruct His view. No way to hide from Him. It can't go where God isn't. You've never been somewhere where God isn't. And throughout your life, you won't be anywhere God is not. The emphasis of the Bible, as really in the other attributes of God that we've been looking at, is that God is especially present for His people. It's not just a a, a theoretical, sort of hypothetical, clinical discussion that we're having about omnipresence. God is especially present where His people are hurting and in need of Him. God is present everywhere because He wants to be present everywhere for His people everywhere. God is here wherever we are, but also He is on our side. It becomes sort of terrifying to think of an omnipresent God who didn't care much for us, who didn't love us, who wasn't interested in what was good for us. But God is on our side. He is with us. He's present with us everywhere, not to destroy us, but to forgive us and to save us from sin. Often His presence is found in Scripture as a promise. That's what we have in Isaiah 43 that we read a little while ago. God speaking to His people, Israel, who have been taken into captivity. They've been taken all over the the known world. They've been scattered from the promised land, from Jerusalem, from the temple. They're separated, isolated, exiled. And God says, wherever you are, I will be with you. I created you. I made you. You're my people. Do not fear, he says. I've remembered you. Do not fear. I'm watching out for you. Do not fear. You're on my mind. And so when you go through the waters or the fire, when you're separated from 
the promised land by sea or by river. When you go through ordeals and struggles and trials, whatever comes your way, whatever happens to you, I am with you, he says. I will be with you. Wherever you go, wherever you are, I will be with you. God knows them and he'll call them. And wherever they are, he knows and he can call them home at any time. From the north and the south, from the ends of the earth. God says, I know you. I'm with you. I'll bring you back. You see that promise borne out in the experience of Daniel and his friends in Babylon. Especially those, those three young men who are, are thrown into the, that flaming furnace because they won't worship the king's gods. You know the story probably. The king, as he's threatened, throws those young men into this, into this furnace to, to destroy them, to burn them up, to execute them. And he looks, and now there's four people in there. And one, one is special. God present with his people in the fire. God knowing what his people are going through and promising to be there with them. Wherever you are, God is there. I know you're in your home, you're, you're with family, but I mean wherever you are in your life, whatever you're going through, whatever your struggle, God is there too. In the sixth month of a virus pandemic, God is there. When you're walking out of the place that used to be your office with your work life in a copier paper box, God is there with you. In the divorce court, God is with you. Spending a lonely night taking care of an aging spouse or parent, God is with you. When you can't sleep for praying for your kids, God's with you. You have never been anywhere that God is not. Never. And you never will be. I love the way A.W. Tozer says it. God is everywhere here, close to everything, next to everyone. God is everywhere here. He's just here. Wherever you are, God is here. He's not in a church building. He's not confined to the pages of the Bible. He's not solely inhabiting the words of a preacher. He is wherever you are, close to everything, next to everyone. There's also another side of God's omnipresence. God is there when you don't necessarily want Him to be. That's what He says to the people of Israel through Jeremiah. People who thought that maybe if they were at the temple when they should be, if they, they observed the Sabbath like they should, if they, they, they did a few things that God wanted them to do that they knew were in the law, He wouldn't notice so much if they took advantage of each other, stole from the weak, oppressed those who couldn't fight back. And God says to them through Jeremiah, Am I a God who is near, declares the Lord, and not a God far off? Can a man hide himself in hiding places so I do not see him, declares the Lord? Do I not fill the heavens and the earth? God asked the people rhetorically if they think he's some sort of local bumpkin God who doesn't get out much. Is that what you think of me, he says? That I'm, I'm some local deity? That, that I just care about what's going on in my temple? Do they really think that they can hide their sins from him? He says, I fill the heavens and the earth. It's a way of saying, don't you know I'm everywhere. Don't you know I'm everywhere? 
Our culture reinforces the idea that God is just a personal matter for me. He's not bigger than my own heart or my own preferences or my own beliefs. That way of thinking about God encourages us to live compartmented lives, segmented lives, where God is in this section of my life, but has nothing to do with the rest of it. God is over here in the church part of my life, but doesn't have anything to do with the work part, or or the friend part, or, or the family part. To say God is omnipresent is to say, at least in part, that there's no part of your life in which He isn't present. Wherever you are, whatever you're doing, He's there. And that's great when we need Him. That's great when we want Him there. It's, it's not always so good when we're doing things that we know wouldn't please Him. And yet He's not surprised by our sins. He's not shocked by what he sees. Do you really think you can shock God? Do you really think you can surprise him with what the human heart is capable of hiding? God wants to be there to forgive us and to transform us. He wants us to let him in all of our lives so that he can have room to do his work, to shape us, to make us into the people He wants us to be. He doesn't need perfection. He doesn't need us to always get it right. Here's what He needs, according to Isaiah 57. Thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, I dwell in a high and holy place, and also with the contrite and lowly of spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of of the contrite. God's high and holy, and He lives in that high and holy place, but He's also present with us. And especially when we're lowly and contrite and sorrowful and grieving and wishing we had done it differently or said something else. God is there to revive, to revive our hearts and to revive our spirits. So in Acts 2.38, the first sermon of the church at Pentecost, Peter stands there and tells the people about the risen Jesus who is present, who is there. People say, what do, you, what do we do? And Peter says, repent. Repent. And be baptized. God, after all, is with the lowly and the contrite. Repent and be baptized, he says. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. God is present in his spirit. Present in all of us. All those who believe in Jesus. All those who put their faith in God's work through Christ in our lives and for our behalf. We receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, God's presence in our lives. Jesus' last words to His disciples on earth is that He will be with them. Matthew 28, 18 through 20, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus says, go everywhere. Go all over the world to every nation. Make disciples. Proclaim the good news. Tell people about Jesus everywhere. Because I am with you always. To the very end of the age. Jesus says, I'll be with you. Just like God promised to His people through Isaiah, Jesus promises to His people now, I will be with you through the very end of the age. 
I love that statement Jesus makes in Matthew 18. Wherever two or three gather in my name, there I am with them. Where God's people are, there He is. We sometimes apply that just to to church services. It doesn't matter how large or how small the service is because because Jesus is there. And that's, that's true, of course, but it's bigger than that. Jesus is saying, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, if two or three of you are gathered in my name, I'm there. And there is significance in the smallest gathering. And there is significance in the smallest agreement to do the work of the kingdom. God is there, wherever there is. You have never been anywhere God is not, and you never will be. So no more living lives broken up into little compartments. Where can you go to get away from God? What compartment can you build that will keep Him out? Trust in His promise that He'll be there wherever there is. And then live in the presence of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit until the very end of the age when we'll see Him with our eyes and be with Him forever. Let's lift our voices to the Lord and then let's sit around our table Uh, around his table with our present Lord. Let's worship together. We gather here in Jesus' name. His love is burning in our hearts like living flame. First Corinthians eleven twenty three through twenty six, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. 
do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What we now observe as communion began on the Jewish annual celebration of Passover, when Jesus told his disciples to remember his sacrifice as they ate the bread and drank the wine. Just as ancient Israel celebrated the Passover lamb when the angel of death passed over their homes, we as believers in Jesus celebrate and remember his sacrifice for our sins when he died on the cross. What we do now is an act of worship and remembrance. What we do now is also an act of unity, particularly during this time of social distancing and remote worship. It is comforting to know that our brothers and sisters in this land and around the world also observe and share in the same hope that gives us joy. With these thoughts in mind, let us pray. Our Heavenly, Sister, Heavenly Father, we love you and praise your holy name. We're thankful for the opportunity we have to gather here remotely and around the world to celebrate your son's resurrection. We're thankful for you allowing him to come to this earth to live a sinless life and to suffer many injustices that we might have the hope of glory with you. Be with us, Father, as we take of these emblems, this bread and this wine, and help us to always live our lives in a way that may bring honor to your name. This our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Once again, thank you so much for being a part of our service this morning. It's been good to be with you online and uh, to share with you in, in worship and in communion and in sharing the Word of God. Uh, thank you for being a part of uh, these services. Thank you for, uh, for joining in as you have, whether it's your first time or whether you've been with us since the uh, beginning of the pandemic. Uh, thank you for, uh, for being a part of this. Uh, just a few announcements to um, uh, let our members know of. Um, Evelyn Wooten has uh, suffered a light stroke. She's doing pretty well. Uh, she's at home and recovering, but uh, please do keep her in your prayers that her recovery will continue to go well and that she'll uh, uh, 
uh, not have any more complications. Laura's uncle, Jim Sabella, is uh, struggling with uh, recovery from his, uh, his hip surgery. Please be with, uh, bless, uh, please pray for him and ask that the Lord will bless and, and be with him uh, during this, this recovery. Uh, and uh, we thank you for, for your prayers there. Um, also, uh, we should keep in mind uh, Hillary Doherty, who is uh, still dealing with uh, illness related to her pregnancy. Lute Motika's youngest sister, uh, who's expecting a baby in December, has been diagnosed with preeclampsia. So please pray for her as well, for her safety and for the babies. And uh, many out of our family here are... Uh, dealing with uh, struggles and, and illness and financial problems and, and work issues and um, all of us dealing with uh, the issues related to the pandemic. So let's uh, continue to pray for one another and uh, stay in touch with each other as well. Uh, if you need uh, the church directory, you can download it uh, from um, the uh, email that uh, we've been sending you uh, out a couple of times a week. We've got one this morning. Uh, you can also download a mobile app for your uh, device uh, as well so that you can stay in touch with each other. It's really important, especially right now, that we, we stay in touch with one another. We stay connected in the ways that we can, um, though we can't all be together. Um, don't forget our, uh, our classes uh, that we have each Sunday, uh, the adult class at 11 a.m. on Zoom. If you didn't get information about that and you want it, please contact us. We can let you know about that. Also, uh, we have uh, classes for our kids, at a class for our kids at uh, 4.30 on Sunday afternoon, also on Zoom. So uh, if you need information about that, you should have gotten it. But if you, you didn't, please uh, contact us and we'll, uh, we'll let you know about that. If there's anything we can do, anything that you need, any way we can help you or serve you at this point in time, uh, please don't hesitate to contact the church office, to contact us by phone, through email, uh, however you uh, can get in touch with us. Please feel free to do so, and we will uh, try to help in any way that we can. Let's pray together, and then we'll have one more song and be dismissed. Father, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you promise to be with us no matter what we're going through. We pray, all of us, Father, that you'll be with us during this, this time of, uh, of uncertainty and fear and, uh, and difficulty and inconvenience. Uh, Father, be present with us and help us to recognize your presence when we see it and in the th ways in which we see it and hear it. We pray that you'd be with our brothers and sisters in Christ struggling with health problems and their, their loved ones also struggling with health problems. We pray for, uh, for Hillary. We pray for Luke's youngest sister that uh, their pregnancies would be, uh, would be safe and healthy and that their babies would remain healthy. And we, we pray for them and ask your presence with them. We pray for our sister Evelyn that you'd be present with her as she recovers from her stroke. Please heal her and please give her her strength back. We pray for Jim Sabella and we pray for your presence and your healing and your encouragement and your strength for him and for his family at this time. We pray too, Father, that you would be with David Jones, be present with him as he grieves the loss of his friend. Please care for him and care for all, Father, who are grieving, who are hurting, who are dealing with loss and, and anxiety and fear and and illness. Father, please be present with us through the, the waters, through the, the fire. Be present with us, whatever we go through. And we pray, Father, that uh, we'll hear your call to home always in our ears and in our hearts, and that we will live our lives uh, in your presence to please you, to honor you. Thank you, Father, for this time together. Thank you for uh, our brothers and sisters in Christ uh, here at this church and here in Chicago and all over the country and all over the world. Thank you for their presence and thank you for their sharing uh, with us in the gospel of Christ. Thank you for that good news, Father. Thank you for that gospel of Christ. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Take the name of Jesus with